Okay, this is episode 49 for me, getting close to 50. And uh, actually, we're going backwards. We recorded episode 50 a couple days ago. We're saving that <laughs> We're saving that one. We did. Uh, we we had a conversation with Bob Eubanks um, from the Newlywood game show from years ago. So uh, that was an interesting one. But we're here with Kurt Dahl in, uh, sitting in Saskatoon. How are you doing, Kurt? I'm great, Darren. Thanks for having me. Yeah, enjoying as well, Brian uh, Edwards uh, from Rocklands Entertainment in Peterborough. How are you doing today, Brian? Great. Looking forward to this very much. I'm sure that uh, Kurt can enlighten us in the world of entertainment on the legal side and how things are going these days with all this COVID and whatnot going on. So we're we're, we're all ears. Yeah, yeah. So, Kurt, you're in Saskatoon, and uh, you're also not just an entertainment lawyer, but also a drummer. And um, you've been touring for a long time. Uh, what's it like being carrying both sides of the fence there, being being a musician and and being a lawyer? It's probably handy on the road. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I always I always make sure I tell other musicians that we're touring with that, that I don't do family law and I don't do criminal law. So, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you have connections. Yeah. <laughs> they're on their own for those two things, but. Um, yeah, you know, honestly, it, now it's a lot easier to balance the two because I'm fortunate enough to have, you know, made a reputation on both sides of the fence, right, as a musician and as a lawyer, because I've done it for a decade plus, you know. So um, I think in the early days, it was definitely, you know, you sort of romanticize the early days of struggle. Um, I definitely am guilty of that. Like, so it, 10 years ago, when I was starting out as an entertainment lawyer and One Bad Son, hadn't had our breakthroughs yet as a band, I think it was a lot more difficult because, you know, I just didn't have, people didn't know me from coast to coast and we'd go on tour as a band and tour the country and, you know, I'd have my laptop and I, I'd try to do as much work as I could on the road. But it, it was definitely, I think, gaining recognition in both that really made things a lot easier. So now, you know, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate that people know me across the country and they know like One Bad Sound, we've had a number one song and a handful of top fives and, you know, open for the Rolling Stones. And so people, there's that immediate um, credibility, I guess, on the musician side. Yeah. And then on the law side, I mean, I've, I've been fortunate to work with some of the biggest people in the industry over the last decade. So I think it's now it's now the brand is great, right? It's almost like I planned the whole thing, but um, in the early days, I didn't, right? I thought the two were kind of um, opposing forces and, and pulling in different directions, and now very much not. They're, they're one and the same, and, and that's why, you know, again, I, I go to the brand thing. I mean, the lawyer, drummer, brand, I mean, now it's like, it seems like it was a, a great, <laughs> well-made, well-hatched plan from the outset, which it sort of happened by accident, you know? Yeah, it was. yeah it's great, because it, looking at hiring an entertainment lawyer and and you see you and you're a musician and you look at it right away, I'd be like, well, this is the guy I want to talk to because he's going to understand me, right? And in the musician point of view or someone in their entertainment point of view. Um, so yeah, that, that's, I don't know. any. Do you know any other entertainment lawyers that actually are musicians? Well, yeah, I think a lot of them are Closet former. musicians. Yeah, you know, like like ho hobby maybe musicians, um, you know, and then there's some that were sort of, you know, f full on musicians back in the day, but now they aren't as much. Um, you know, for me, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I think there was a time when One Bad Son we were touring, you know, ten months of the year, right? The full just living it, right? Just touring our asses off, and um, that was before I had kids and before the legal practice was so busy. And so I'm glad we're not doing that anymore. Like I did that. I did that for a decade. Um, so now it's, but I'm not an inactive musician. I, I think, so to your question, I think there are many entertainment lawyers who used to be musicians. Um, but, I, you know, last year we had a, a huge year with the band. And again, we had the Rolling Stones show and that sort of thing. And um, so, I, I mean, now I've got two young kids and a third on the way in T minus uh, 30 days. So, uh, you know, so we're not like, I'm not touring as much as I used to. And I, I like that. It's more about, you know, quality now instead of quantity. So, and then it, you know, couple that with the fact that the law practice 
has gotten so damn busy, which is a great thing. So, um, yeah, it's sort of the days of, of being in a van for 10 months of the year are behind me, but you know, there's still, we're still writing music and releasing it and doing some great things. So it's, uh, it helps balance it a bit, you know? Great. So you're based in Saskatoon. Um, do you, do you work mostly out of your home base in Saskatoon or are you having to travel quite a bit on the lawyer end of side of things? Yeah. Great question. So, um, you know, I moved to Vancouver, my wife and I moved to Vancouver about a decade ago to start, you know, to sort of get my legal career and the music career off the ground. You know, and I think both of you can relate to the fact that, you know, the real heart of the industry side of the music industry is in Toronto, Vancouver, I mean, maybe Montreal, but you know, the big centers really do, if you want to be where the action is, you got to be in those big centers and it's the same in America, you know? Um, so we did that. And the band got to that next level. We were touring. That's around the time when we were doing like the 10 months of the year on the road. And then, of course, the entertainment law career got off the ground there. And once we got to a point on both sides of the fence where people knew me across the country, then we I was able to come back to Saskatoon um, already having that recognition. Because, yeah. um, you know, once we decided we're going to start a family, both our families are here. I mean, Family is number one, as I'm sure you'll find in our interview today. I mean, family is everything for me. And so it, we always knew we wanted to come back to Saskatoon, but we had to sort of, just like in the, uh, the ancient times, we had to go out and sort of fight the battles out on the road and make a name for yourself and then come back a hero. You know, yeah. um, you couldn't just, if I had stayed here the whole time, it's, I mean, I don't think the credibility is there and, and the experience isn't there. I had to go to the big city. Um, and so now... The law firm that I work for, Murphy & Company, it's a good friend of mine, Tim Murphy, and there's 10 other lawyers. They're all based in Vancouver, and they're great uh, business, you know, corporate lawyers. And then I'm the, the long-haired uh, entertainment lawyer. Um, <laughs> so they, you know, they fly me out to, or they did pre-COVID, fly me out to Vancouver every like three months. So at least I'd have that FaceTime with a lot of my, you know, record label and musician clients there. But And then a lot are based in Toronto. So, so to your point, you know, I, I, again, pre COVID I'd fly to Toronto every three or four months, you know? And so, I mean, being based in Saskatoon, I love it. Again, this is family. This is where family is. You know, I got a nice big yard for the kids, which is not as easy to do in like downtown Vancouver. Um, yeah. but I have to, yeah, I, I do have to kind of work a bit harder in terms of traveling, just, you know, check in on Vancouver and Toronto every now and then. Um, but I mean, to me, it's the perfect balance. Cause again, we've got, we have everything we need here in, in, in terms of our home yeah. and our family. And again, I, th I think the internet, obviously social media helps too. So if you're out of sight, out of mind, that's not good as, as a musician or as an entertainment lawyer. So that's why I'm always posting articles, writing articles about, you know, prescient issues in the music biz. And thankfully they get picked up all over the country, all over the world. So at least I'm on, I'm, I'm, sort of top of mind for a lot of people in the industry, even though I'm not in the big centers. Are you limited to what areas you can practice in or can you go from one end of the country to the other? Like some lawyers have to, like you're an Ontario lawyer and you got a BC lawyer and you got a East Coast lawyer. Can you go from one end to the other or do you have to tie in with a local firm, right? How does that work? That's a great question, Brian. Um, yeah, like Canada, it's a lot easier to, to practice coast to coast um, than America, for example, in America, you know, a Nashville lawyer versus a New York versus California versus Alabama, <laughs> a lot of different, different types of laws there, you know, um, where in entertainment law and in Canada, you can go coast to coast. I mean, there's certain requirements you have to have a certain percentage of your practice has to be in the provinces that you're called to the bar, but that's not an issue. Um, but yeah, you know, to your point, I mean, I've got clients in Newfoundland. I got clients on, on Vancouver Island. So it really is coast to coast. And the laws don't really, at least in terms of entertainment law, they don't change. You know, with things like, you know, I'm sure family law, for example, has different rules and regulations in each province. But, you know, by and large, a record deal that's being offered in Toronto is going to have the exact same, you know, jurisdictional issues as one in, in B.C., Etc. You know, so I, I'm very lucky for that. I'm very fortunate for that. 
Very good. Yeah. I like the sounds of that. That's really good. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. works out good. Yeah. And, you know, it's being in Sask- Saskatoon, I love Saskatoon. Uh, we- it's one of my favorite places. Saskatoon uh, Berry Pie, you can't go wrong. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's. Uh, I was thinking before we chatted. I've been doing shows in Saskatoon for about Brian, probably longer than me, but at least almost forty years. Um, right. Started back playing at the Saskatoon Exhibition uh, with my family right. group way back when, when that was rolling. And um, Brian and I, we get into Saskatoon doing shows probably at least two or three times a year uh, when things are rolling. Uh, but yeah, I love I love the town. Yeah, we do. We're a lot of fun there. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we always say like like we joked about beforehand. I mean, before the call, um, you know, like Saskatoon in the summer is just like to me nothing beats it. Uh, winters are obviously tough. I mean, that's I mean, if if anyone has negative things to say about Saskatoon, that's probably it. Is the winters? Um, so we you know we make sure we get away to whatever Mexico or somewhere hot you know and to break up those winters, but you know, what it's really about is the people and, you know, we move back here for the people and it really is that sort of like, it's big enough to have, you know, nice restaurants and all that sort of stuff. But, but it's small enough that there really is a sense of community. And I think um, to some extent that's, that can get lost in the big cities, the, the sense of, you know, you, you belong to a community and you're going to act as if you belong to a community. And, sometimes I didn't feel that in the bigger cities, you know? Yeah. That's why we operate where we operate too. It works great. <laughs> You're part of the community. So it's really good. I always say yeah. that Saskatoon, Saskatoon became a world-class city as soon as it got the cactus club. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the cactus club where we're at. <laughs> I know right next, right next to the theater. It's even, it's even better. So it works out good. So let's go back before we kind of get into some uh, stuff that's going on now in your life. Uh, go back to how you started and obviously you you did you grow up in Saskatoon or in that area yeah yeah and then we um you know one bad son we started in 2004 which is kind of crazy now to, to look to think back to that um so like I, I yeah I was in law school and I graduated law school 2005 so one bad son started you know sort of mid law school and I was that one guy in law school who said I'm not going to become a lawyer because I want to become a rock star. And so I got, so all my law school friends who are still very much, you know, in touch today and they follow me and they always cheer me on, you know, in terms of on the music well, on both sides, but they, they like to be, they like to brag about, you know, their one friend who actually went and did music, you know, and, um, you know, I graduated law school and everyone else has got, you know, you've got all these student loans, which I very much had. And so you go in and you start working for a big firm and, paying down those loans and started to make the big money, you know, and, yeah. um, but that wasn't my path. I wanted to do the band thing. So, but, so I did that for two or three years after law school, just did music, toured the country, but it was so early in our career that it wasn't, it wasn't our time. It wasn't our time to have top five singles and stuff. We just weren't there yet. We weren't good enough yet in terms of the songwriting, et cetera. So, um, and then I d- realized around that time, so 2007, we'll say, um, that's when I realized in 2008, around that time, um, all the whole, the whole downloading phenomenon of music came came to be came to the fore. Yeah. So, you know, the industry was in crisis, as you guys I'm sure can remember. Everyone was saying that the genie's out of the bottle. We're never gonna. How are we going to? How is the music industry gonna survive if people aren't paying for music and paying you know twenty dollars for a CD? Like, what what are we gonna do here? And so I thought, what a great time to combine my passions of law and music and write a thesis on on that topic you know what is the future of the music industry in the digital world and so that's why i decided to do a master's in law on on that exact topic and so it took me you know uh, about a year and a half two years to write this to research and, and write this thesis on where is the industry heading if we keep going down the path of the digital world which of course we have and and what you know how do you make a living as a musician in 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 this digital world so that's what i did i put my head in the books for for two years basically and but there's not a lot of textbooks on this topic as you can imagine no uh none (laughs) yeah so what i did is a lot of sort of what they call primary research where 
I, I reached out to, and again, I, was, I wasn't a lawyer at the time. I was just a law school graduate and I wasn't an established or recognized musician yet, but I reached out to all the big players in the industry in Canada and the US. So entertainment lawyers, uh, managers, record labels, booking agents, publishers, publicists. And I just interviewed all these people and, and got, got their thoughts on where the industry was heading. Um, and then I put it together in, in, in a thesis and that's sort of what planted the seed that, Hey, I should, this is like, this is both my passions at play here. Um, this could be something for me. And, and that's kind of the beginning of how I became an entertainment lawyer. Cause I realized that there was, there was a need for this. So what, what did the outcome come from the, the thesis? What did you find out was the, is this many years later, did things which you thought were going to happen happen? And what were, you, what were your conclusions on everything with that? Well, you have to read the 150 page thesis to get the full <laughs> answer. <Gary. laughs> uh, Cole's notes. No, just, uh, no, I'll spare you. Um, you know, I mean, the big thing I found was I, mean, I sort of at the end of it, I put sort of, I think it was like eight or nine sort of predictions and, um, and a lot of them did come true. Like, I mean, the big thing, the big prediction was that, artist's main source of revenue is going to be live music, which wasn't always the case. As you guys can remember, I mean, back in the day, you know, Led Zeppelin would charge five bucks to go see them, but the real thing was so you'd go buy the record, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, it used to be that the live shows got people to buy records and now the record, it's the opposite, of course. Records get you out to the live show so you can pay $200 for for <laughs> not, not even that great a seat, you know. Yeah. Um, so that was one major prediction, which I think the writing was on the wall at that time anyways, but it really has come true. I mean, if you look at concerts, I mean, and of course this all predicated on the idea that COVID didn't happen, but yeah. I, that's, that's a whole other discussion. But um, another prediction was that the value of recorded music would keep going down, continue, continue to decline, you know, and, and that's true, at least in terms of from a financial perspective, you know, the value has kept going down. Um, and that's, that has, I think it has more profound effects too. I mean, if you devalue recorded music, you know, in terms of financial terms, I think it also has a psychological impact too, that people, music is sort of, you know, I, it's sort of, um, it's just there and it, it's, it's not as maybe sacred as it once was. I, I don't know, but yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, and that's, and then I think another prediction was that the, the song, right? Like there's two copyrights in every song, you know, one in the recording and one in the, in the songwriting. Um, my prediction was that the, the songwriting copyright would continue to be more and more uh, valued and the recording copyright would, would continue to go down. So, and that's, I think that's really become true, um, come true because music is being used more than ever these days. It's in, it's everywhere we see it's ubiquitous and the use of music generates money for whoever wrote the song and the purchase of music generates money for whoever owns the recording. And so you see that, yeah, as songwriters or publishers, of course, um, those catalogs are still really valuable. It's just that recorded like record deals aren't, aren't given the huge advances anymore because people aren't buying records like they used to. So, yeah, that's interesting for sure. Did you find when you're interviewing everyone for the thesis that, that everyone kind of had the same outlook or was it quite different from everyone you talked to? Yeah. At the time it was quite different because some wanted to sort of put the genie back in the bottle, as you'd say. Yeah. Uh, they just thought that we have to crack down and start, which of course Napster ended up doing. They started suing people that were, you know, they sued that old, you know, some 80 year old woman who downloaded a song uh, for her, for her granddaughter or something. And so you got those, those ludicrous cases where it's like Napster is suing, you know, an 80 year old woman <laughs> who downloaded one song. I, I think some people felt that that was the answer just sue everyone. So that everyone's afraid to download music. Now, of course that was not never going to work. I mean, you can't put the genie back in the bottle and what we've gone to now is people don't really, I shouldn't say they don't, but Napster and those kind of services where you download music illegally are kind of irrelevant now. I mean, mostly it's people just stream because yeah. streaming, it's, it almost feels like it's free, but it's not. 
um, the downside, and that's a whole, this is a whole other podcast, but the streaming of music, I mean, no one gets paid for artists don't get paid really. Right. Like no. we get, you know, one bad son has millions of streams on Spotify and I think we've got, you know, maybe a, a hundred dollars over the, you know, the last five years or something like it's, it's nothing. Right. So, um, but again, that's a whole other discussion, right? Yeah. It's, it's more just like a platform to get your music out there. It's like, it's like a Facebook or Instagram. It's a, it's a face for your, your product and a way for people to see and hear it. But nowadays there isn't really a value put on that product anymore. Um, as you say, the product, the value is getting out and doing gigs and making money from live gigs. And, uh, you know, and certainly the most unfortunate time for COVID to come along because that's really the only uh, source of income for most musicians nowadays is getting out there and actually doing the gigs. And on top of it, probably the least amount of gigs available uh, and venues available, and there's going to be even less venues and places available after after COVID's done. So it's yeah. it's a really, you know, most people don't think about that either is that musicians and artists and singers all make their money and are hitting the road. And a year from now, uh, you know, there's so little amount of places for play, people to play now. Uh, it's going to be even that much less um, coming up. Uh, it's it's a little scary, but uh, it's just have to work through it. Well, you're right, Darren. I think that's the real, the real scary part of COVID is, you know, I've got I've got a lot of venue clients, you know, some great music venues across the country and they're the ones that are hardest hit because they, you know, a lot of the artists can find other ways to get funding, whether it be, you know, government funding or doing the occasional live show online or whatever. I mean, it's not, it's not ideal by any means, but the venues, you know, they got, they got rent to pay and it's usually quite significant if they're a bigger venue and they're, they're the last to reopen, of course. And, I've already, I mean, as we all have seen already, there's, there's been some legendary venues shut down. Right. And it's just, so when this is over, everyone's going to be itching, all the musicians are going to be itching to get out there and play, but you're going to find some of your favorite venues are no longer, which is really sad. It's interesting because one of the things I listened to last week was um, a guy that ran the horseshoe in, in Lee's palace in Toronto and they haven't even opened up there for 50 people yet. But he was telling me when they did open up, or they do open up, they're going to have to have plexiglass in front of the bands, and they don't want, they can't have any access to the public at all. He says, like watching a show through an aquarium. He said, who the heck wants to do that? So yeah. I think we're so far away. I mean, venues that are two or 3,000 seats are calling here, want to know if we can put shows together for 100 or 200 people. And that's, that's pretty sad. But that's what it's going to be, I think. As, as Darren said, those are the venues that are going to be, they're well subsidized through whatever source they are cities or municipalities or federal or provincial and that's what it's going to be i think the club days are i i hate to think of it because we need the clubs that's what it's a stepping stone to get everybody up to everything else so yeah yeah you're so right brian like i think you're right that the thousand even a thousand seat venue if they can only have 100 people like that is one tenth of the revenue they could be making so you know of course it's going to affect the the guarantee they're going to give the artists. Mm. So if, if the artist is expecting the same guarantees they got before, I mean, how is that possible if it's a one-tenth the audience, right? Yeah. We're all in the same playing field these days. We'll have the same price, zero, because there's nothing <laughs> we can do. So you're going to build from there. So hopefully, you know, hopefully it gets back. But it's uh... – now, do you – when you say you represent venues a lot, uh, do you represent them from the side of reviewing some of these contracts that come in or liability issues or – yeah. To what extent are you involved with that? You know, mostly it's, um, you know, yeah, like, you know, n reviewing and negotiating the lease they have with the landlord, or sometimes it'll be working on sponsorship deals they have with, um, you know, different, uh, let's say they sponsor, they work with Jim Beam to get a good sponsorship deal on every concert that comes through the venue. Jim Beam gets to be the presenting sponsor. Okay. So I'll negotiate that sort of deal. Um, and then just more sort of business law things. Like if there's multi, if there's three, three shareholders that own the venue, you draft a shareholder agreement and um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it's mostly like business law, like a typical business. Um, yeah, and then helping, I guess, with, yeah, give advice as far as now with COVID, like the best steps for reopening. Like how, how are you going to do it without, you know, obviously if someone gets sick in your venue, that's going to be a huge PR nightmare. So just giving them general advice on that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah it's interesting on on the venue end of things because uh, as you were mentioning there's there's a lot of venues that don't get the government support or the municipal support or the federal support and uh i'm even just going through that now with our venue here our family owns a theater and we just don't uh we're not suitable for anything that's being given out um we just don't apply and it's it's frustrating because i see a lot of money getting dished out to a lot of people um, and it's yeah. all going to the people who've already got it before. Um, and I understand how that, that system works. You're in the system. They're used to giving, you know, particular people money, particular venues money, and they're just getting more. Um, uh, of course they need money as well. Uh, but it really hurts the venues that rely on just making money on their own. Um, and being successful at not having to worry about getting grants and, and loans or whatever you have to to survive they actually put in the hard work and they make it happen and now all these venues are are the ones that are going to be the ones that really get in trouble uh, that's going to be the tough one yeah it's it's yeah it's probably the scariest part of this whole thing is what venues will be left when this is over yeah mm. uh it was interesting i know brian and i were reading an article um this morning on uh it was basically if there was a, f a festival right in 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 la or out of, that uh were trying to get their deposit money back uh i'm not sure if you saw that right up uh come across today and and with will and morris and will and morris was like uh no <laughs> <laughs> it's like all of our acts were willing and able to play um but uh so we're not going to give you your deposit back um, right. It, it's interesting all these little clauses in these contracts um, on both sides that are going to really play out differently because everyone's going to want and need a place to play. Um, and if you burn too many bridges now, it's going to be uh, it's going to be difficult in the future. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, I've, this has come across my desk many times in the last three months, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, what's what's happened? Like all these bands that have all these shows are booked and deposits have been given. Now what, you know, and, and I've been called by both festival clients and artist clients. So I've seen both sides. Um, what I'm seeing happening and there's no sort of playbook or, or set rule on this, but you know, the, you know, let the artist keep the deposit or, or you know, the agent or whoever has it um, and just reschedule the artist for the, the next for 2021. Right. Um, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's assuming A, the festival happens in 2021, because it may not. Yeah. And assuming B, that the artist is available for that date in 2021. So yeah, I think most most artists are just keeping the half, the 50% deposit and we'll see what happens, you know, if, if it happens, if the event happens next year. Well, it's a cash flow problem on both sides, right? Because you've got the venue or the festival yeah. that needs cash flow and you have the agent or the uh, the artist that needs cash flow and in a typical deposit situation which uh brian and i have seen multiple times that you get a deposit you give it a deposit that doesn't mean that that money gets saved and put into trust most of the time it gets put into a bank account and it just it's in and it's out again and it's it's not saved until the, the actual show uh you know, comes into fruition. Um, what, what, in, in your thought on things on a, kind of on a legal side of things, what for everyone that's kind of listening, who's a, a musician or an, a venue, as far as a deposit goes, legally, my understanding, you're not allowed to touch that money until the actual show uh, partakes. It's not something you should be spending. That's correct. Yeah, I guess it depends on the contract, of course. Like, what, what, is, what does the contract say? But you're right. Most agencies have a standard, con like with One Bad Son, you know, our, 
our agent is Feldman. And so they've got their standard Feldman contract. Right. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think technically you're right. I mean, it's, it's not like, it's not money, free money, like, or money that you're able to just spend freely. You know, it's basically, it's, can, we're giving you half contingent on the fact that you're going to play our event and meet all the requirements of playing our event is and not have a meltdown on stage in two minutes into the first song or something. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I think technically if you spend that money and then never do the show, well, in theory, you owe that deposit back um, unless there's other language there that allows you to keep it. If it gets canceled for whatever, you know, an act of God or that sort of thing. But yeah, it's not like it's just money that can be put into your pocket and, and spent. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's I like, like the way you think. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the way we look at it too. Because uh, on top of that, a lot of venues are collecting ticket money and spending that ticket money before the show uh, yeah. happens as well. So when you come in, um, which is which is a weird thing, and we, we've Brian and I have had these conversations over and over again, and and mm -hmm. like who belongs to that money right if you're coming in as a promoter into a venue to to promote a show they're collecting money for you it goes into their bank account but then they spend it to pay bills and do whatever and you you come along and all of a sudden you have to wait three weeks to get paid because there's nothing in the bank account um you know a lot of venues are running like that it's, it's an issue um and i think this whole covid situation is going to clean up a lot of that I think people are going to get a little scared now and they're going to like, okay, we're going to have to start saving some of this money if this happens again, because um, yep. a lot of people aren't getting ticket money back or deposits back because this, there just isn't any money there. Do you get any, do you get any of that side of law? Do you deal with much of that sort of stuff where ticket money just isn't there and people try to get refunds and all that sort of stuff? Is that a, a whole different area or where, where does all that sit? Yeah, it usually is, Brian. I mean, like, I guess there's times where those sort of files come across my desk where money is owed and they're trying to trace where it is. And, but it ends up becoming sort of a litigation matter. Um, and I, I don't do litigation. Like I don't go to court and, and, you know, either you're a litigator or you're not sort of thing. And, and yeah. litigation just gets too messy and it's not, you know, I don't need to do it. But um, so if there is a situation where X owes Y, a certain amount of money um, and they got, they got to track down where it is or who, who, who has it right now. Um, that's usually, I say, you know, I'll refer to like a litigator at our firm or, or, or somewhere else, you know, that's a good idea. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So as far as uh, working in, in law, what is your favorite uh, thing to do as far as uh, entertainment lawyer? Do you have a certain, uh, do you like negotiating record deals or what, what's the thing that you enjoy doing the most? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, um, like I, there, there's certain times where an artist just is blowing up and everyone wants, wants to sign them. And, you know, they really are just the next it, it artist, you know, and I've had many of those artists as clients have been fortunate to have those artists as clients over the years I love those situations because everyone comes to you first off. You don't, I don't have to go out and try to shop an artist and convince everyone how, how great they are. Everyone's coming to me and they know I'm the lawyer and I'm getting emails and phone calls and, you know, basically everything except for like sending me gifts, but you know, my mail. <laughs> um, um, so th those are great situations where you, an artist has got so much hype and you're acting as their lawyer and you can sort of, to a certain extent, name your price, you know, in terms of, because all the major players are, are wanting to invest. Right. And, um, and mostly that I like that because it's also just exciting to see, to see that f for an artist to ha happen to an artist, you know, like what a great, what an amazing gift to be able to have that experience as an artist in your life. Because as we all know, I mean, so many artists work so hard and struggle and never become the it artist. I mean, it, it can only happen to one in a million or more. Right. Um, so it's just cool to see that when, when it really does happen and you've, you know, you become that it artist. So an example would be, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with tones and I, 
Yeah, I know the name. Yep. Yeah, Tones and I, like, she's a huge pop artist. Um, just, you know, probably in the last year, probably the biggest sort of underground success story. She was just a busker in, um, in Australia and just busking on the street one day. And this guy walked by who happened to be a former entertainment lawyer. He, he tried being an entertainment lawyer and wasn't that good at it. He admits. And he thought, I, you know, I want to manage artists and I'm better at management. So he walks by this girl busking and she broke into singing and the crowd just was just entranced, you know, and, um, he knew right away that she would be the next big thing, which is what, what a cool story. Uh, they recorded a song within the next month, and within like three months, there was a bidding war on her around the world with, for major labels. And he, as an entertainment lawyer, reads all my articles that I put on my website. Um, and he reached out and just said, hey, I've got this client. And he didn't tell me her name. He just said, i got this client. I want some help on negotiating these deals. And so, so I'm happy to help you know, you're in Australia, which obviously I'm not called to the bar there, but the deals were coming from America. And, you know, I can, I do a lot of American deal negotiations and I'm able to do that because, you know, we have an agent in the U S. So if there ever is jurisdictional issues, it's all good. Anyways, um, next thing I know, you know, I'm negotiating probably the, the hottest artist in the world with all the major labels. And, you know, I'm on a phone call with, you know, five high, highly ranked uh, New York entertainment lawyers. They have no clue where Saskatoon is. They, they can't even pronounce <laughs> Saskatoon. Um, and of course, the, to my benefit, they underestimate me to a certain extent because I'm not in New York. I'm in Saskatoon. So that I'm able to use that. I like when people underestimate me more than overestimate me, you yeah. know? Um, so I'm able to sort of run circles around them a bit in the negotiation, which they didn't, they didn't foresee. And, but at the end of the day, it's like this girl, she was, you know, 18 at the time or something, literally overnight. I mean, it really truly was an overnight sensation. And I got to sort of protect her to a certain extent, like make sure she signed the right deal. Because when you're 18, I mean, life is crazy as it is. But when you're being offered millions of dollars, I mean, you can really make bad decisions um, in contract form and in life in life form, you know. So I was able to sort of act as a bit of a shield for her to protect her from the big, bad major label and make sure she got the best deal possible. And I mean, she became a, mil a millionaire overnight and she's, she's gone on to do really great things and it seems to be, you know, quite uh, grounded, you know, and, and quite, quite happy. So, um, so anyways, that's a long answer to your short question, Darren, but no, I, I just love situations like that where who, like, I mean, how do they, how they ended up with me, um, is kind of uh, random and, and amazing. And then I was able to really make sure that she got the best deal possible. And, um, yeah, it's like, what, wh what a crazy set of situations and oh, yeah. set of circumstances. And I, I just feel very lucky that I'm able to have those opportunities, you know, definitely what <laughs> nowadays makes a good deal. Um, you know, right. I know 20 years ago would made a good deal, but as far as a contract for a young, let's say 18 year old singer, and that's not put her into the contract, but just in a general, what, what's the deciding factor lots of times in a good deal? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, at the end of the day, it has to be the right deal. Like it has to be custom made for that artist just sort of cookie cutter template deals that don't, they can't be applied to every single artist situation. Yeah. Um, and that's why I would say there's no, no two deals are the same and nor should they be the same because every artist has different strengths and different weaknesses uh, in terms of their business. Right. So if you're making a deal for, let's go back to some older bands. I love if you're making offering a deal to the grateful dead, you don't want to rely too heavily on, like the deal should be structured around the live show because that's where they have all their following. And if you make the deal based on record sales, well, Grateful Dead were famous for, for their fans bootlegging all their, all their live shows. So you're not going to, it's, if it's based on record sales, that's a bad business uh, model. Yeah. Whereas, um, and then some artists, some clients of mine don't want to tour. They just want to write songs for other people 
or for themselves, but it's all about, yeah, the songs, not the touring. So you got to adjust it that way. Um, some artists have a great connection with their fans in terms of their merchandise. Like the, the merchandise is, if you think of like, I don't know, the Ramones, for example, everyone's got a, how many times you see a Ramones t-shirt in a day, you know? So draft the deal based on that to make the most of it, but also, um, you know, capitalize on those strengths. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and I guess at the end of the day, you know, there's always sort of like that three, the 360 deal is, is, is a four letter word, but these days that's not the case. I mean, when I say 360, as you guys know, but maybe the listeners don't like any deal that involves things rights beyond just the, the, the recording, yeah. we call that a 360. So publishing or merchandise or touring, if the label gets any of those things, I call it a 360. Um, I think these days having some aspects of a 360 makes sense because again, people aren't buying records like they used to. So there needs to be some other revenue source there for the label to really make the most of, of the catalog. But if there are 360 rights there, we got to make sure they're negotiated fairly and um, they're not, the label's not taking too much. Or if the label's getting a, a taste of touring, well, what are they doing in order to help that touring? You know, if the label gets a cut of publishing, what are they doing to, to make the most of the publishing? So yeah, um, yeah. that's another long winded uh, lawyerly answer for you. No, that's good. That's what you want to hear. <laughs> so as, as far as a young or anybody that's, that's trying to get a deal or wants that, that be part of their life. Right. Um, yeah. And we're in COVID now we're not gigging. Uh, you know, you can't get people out to see your shows and all that from kind of the deals you've been working on and doing, what kind of suggestions would you give to uh, anyone that's working towards that? And, you know, it, what's the strong point that a lot of record companies are looking at? Are they, are they really concerned about your Instagram numbers or your Twitter numbers or, or, you know, I'm sure it's still all combination, but um, you know, are, are artists looking too much at, you know, I have to make sure that I have a big Instagram following over, making sure that I have really great songs and, you know, we we're actually practicing and, and sounding good. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's one thing that I just, it's a pet peeve of mine is that, you know, labels are so focused on, yeah, your social media numbers. And I get it. Like that's the world we live in now, but some of my best clients started with nothing in terms of socials, you know, uh, Coulter wall is a great example, a good friend of mine and my client. And, he started off with like nothing on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. He, he didn't care to post, you know, like it just wasn't his thing. He's, he's more happy to just sit and listen to Jimmy Rogers and, and, and John Prine and, and, you know, and focus on his craft. And of course, in the long run, that's way, that's, that's served him very well. He writes great songs and now all this, you know, the following comes to him. When you write great songs, you know, your, your followers will come to you. Yeah. Um, and I almost, I'm also just sort of, you know, I'm, I'm old school insofar as, yeah, you got to do the work. You got to write the songs. You got to tour, hone your chops. And that's way more important than trying to be a, a, an influencer on Instagram or, or whatever, right? I mean, there's people that have millions of followers on Instagram and they don't have any real fans. They're just followers because, well, you know, who knows why they have the followers? Maybe the... There's different reasons, but they're, they're not followers and fans are two different things, you know? And, yeah. um, I, I really encourage musicians to focus on your craft, to get real fans that are there because they love your music and what you have to say, not because of how you look or how cool your photos look. I mean, to hell with that stuff. I mean, that's, the, that's not going to last in the long term. Um, and again, it's the people like whatever the Coulter walls or the, you know, it, those that really put their, time into their craft. I mean, um, that's the thing I love about the Rolling Stones, for example. I mean, they were, you know, Mick and Keith were famously locked in a room until they could write their first original song, you know, by their, their manager, locked them in a room and said, write your first original song. And it took them hours, but they finally did it. And then they just kept doing that. And, you know, I always think of this too. I mean, if John Lennon was alive today or Kurt Cobain was alive today, you know, 
what would they have to say about the whole, you know, Instagram influencer phenomenon? You know, like um, people, there's got to be something more to being a musician than just getting followers. You know, there's got to be something more. You got to have something to say and you got to be good at your, your craft. Um, yeah. So that's what I, and I, and to late, I've also seen labels sign artists that just have tons of followers and, and then they re, they think that that'll make, make for a successful recipe in terms of a record deal. And then it turns out, I mean, the followers, like I said, they aren't actual fans that they're not going to buy the record or, or go to buy the concert tickets. Yeah. So, and a lot of times the followers are fake too, bear in mind, right? Like yeah. some people have you can buy, you can buy followers. So, um, so again, labels that invest in artists strictly because of social media presence, that's short sighted. I'd rather be, I mean, again, like it's like artists that are just in it for like Neil Young is a great example. He's in it. He's been around for how many years now does what he wants, says what he means or means what he says and says what he means. Yeah. Doesn't have number one hits like say today's current pop arts doesn't have number one hits doesn't sell millions of records on any one song, but over his career, he sold millions of records and concert tickets because he's true to himself. And I think I, that's why I said to young artists, be, be Neil Young. Don't be, you know, to more, you know, today's sort of pop phenomenon that's going to be gone in a week. Yeah. Amen. Cause yeah, <laughs> for sure. It really comes down to longevity too. I mean, that's like, you mentioned that it's, if you want to be 60, 70 years old and, be working a casino somewhere and singing all your big hits you better have some good songs and you better have some some legs there because you know yeah. by that time instagram's not gonna, <laughs> you're gonna be long gone <laughs> or, or, or yeah or replaced by something else or yeah. whatever yeah exactly. yeah exactly think think long term i love it yeah mm. so what's your least favorite part of uh your role as a lawyer entertainment lawyer um there's got to be some things you don't enjoy doing yeah and i was i was thinking of that when i was talking about talking about my favorite because yeah. you know you knew that was going to come <laughs> yeah, yeah you know i just yeah and these are the things that um you can't avoid i mean especially if you have success as a lawyer for example i mean there's going to be things that uh that come with a job that you're not a fan of and, and so I've been fortunate that I've had these things, but yeah, it's my least favorite is, you know, negotiating, doing a negotiation when things are really negative between the two parties. You know, an example is someone's leaving a band, right? Or they get fired or they, they, they quit because at one point they were, they, the, the, let's say the two members of the band got along so well, but then at some point they end up hating each other. Yeah. So um, negotiating that, what that looks like, who gets to use the name going forward, what sort of payout is involved to get for this person to leave the band? Um, all that sort of, like it, when there's really negative emotions involved on two sides, it could be also with a manager and, and an artist, for example, yeah. you know, the artist really succeeds and they realize that the manager can't handle the, the scope of things. So they want to let go of the manager and that manager feels on the other side of the fence that they, the artist wouldn't be where they are if not for the manager's work and sacrifice and hard work. So it's a negative situation and someone's got to do the work and, you know, they come to me and I want to be there for my clients. Right. So I got to negotiate it. And, you know, I just, I find not that I can't handle the negative, but it's just, it's, 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 you have a negative uh, or negativity in your life. If you're dealing with that file, right. You, you can't avoid it. I mean, like it's, it can be quite harsh or, or tense with the other lawyer and there's a lot of emotions involved. And yeah, at, at the end of the day, the final result isn't this big positive. It's like, as in with the negotiating the, the deal for an artist, that's the next big thing. The end result is positive or the end result in this situation is still going to be negative. It's, it's, it's almost like, I imagine being a family lawyer and doing a divorce, you know, yeah. um, I couldn't, that's why I can never be a divorce lawyer. I mean, everything you do is negative and, um, there's kids involved often and it's just, I would never touch it, you know? Um, but it's akin to that, right? Where there's two sides that are separating it's negative emotions, negative energies, and the end result is still probably going to be negative. Um, although I, you know, we try to do our best to make it 
the best thing possible for both sides, right? Yeah. But yeah, those are tough. And then you have to do it. And sometimes they take they take two years to negotiate. And it's just sort of this albatross on your shoulder. Um, but you gotta you gotta put your head down and get it done. Yeah. Put on your uh, your big boy pants and just do it, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I can see that for sure. What about nowadays uh, with a newer artist? If you're trying to maybe someone come up to you and wants to manage you, um, be an agent, how important is it for a band or singer to come to someone like you to negotiate that type of deal? Or is it good to kind of slide into it and kind of see how it works for a while and then you know try to get together with a lawyer to negotiate? Or is that something you know you should look at right away? That's a good question. I think anytime, like I, I say this all the time and, and, and it's not a try, me trying to get more work. It's just me trying to protect artists. I say, if a contract's put in front of you, like obviously go, call someone, it doesn't have to be me, but you know, call an entertainment lawyer that you trust. And, or just like, I think I've had artists sign deals and then come to me and ask for advice. Yeah. And of course that doesn't work, you yeah. know, <laughs> um, I can't, I, again, I can't undo, I can't time travel, you know? Um, so, and I think, and I asked, why didn't you call me first? And they said, well, I, just, I, I thought it'd be too expensive or whatever. And, and I get that. I mean, lawyers have a reputation of being expensive, of course. Um, and to that, I say, well, A, you know, I'm probably a lot more reasonable than any other lawyer out there because I actually care about musicians. And B, it's going to cost, it's going to be a lot more expensive in the long term to not get advice. So, and a lot of times I'd say, just email me the contract and I'll send you like, a, I'll look at it and send you back a quote. So you know what you're, what you're in for sort of thing, you know? Um, and if everything's fine, I'll just say, go sign it, you know? Um, but yeah, to your question, I think you got to just getting advice on something sooner than later is always a good idea because even if the, the manager says, let's just, let me manage it for a bit and then we'll, worry about the contract I sent later. That can be tricky because if they start managing you, then there's sort of an implied agreement already in place. Yeah. Um, there's sort of the law of common law, which states that like, I've got some people that some management, some managers that have never signed a deal with their clients, but because they're managing and the artist is accepting those management services, there's an implied contract there already. And they could then take you to court and say, well, I was your manager, even though there's nothing in writing, but you clearly let me manage you and I charge you a percentage and therefore I was your manager. We don't need a contract. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a stretch of an argument, but it, it happens all the time. So anyways, long story short, Darren, I think, yeah, get advice, reach out to an entertainment lawyer just to get their opinion. And um, it's, it's, I look at it like you're investing in your career. And I think, Every artist, once they get to a certain point, has a team around them, manager, record label, booking agent, publicist, and entertainment lawyer. And a good entertainment lawyer is part of that team. I mean, with my biggest clients, I mean, they involve me on every decision. Like they'll call me and say, what do you think the next single should be? And I give input on that. They ask me, what do you think of this, uh, this publicist? Is he or she good? I'll give my opinion. You know, it's like, I'm more than just like the, the pen and paper guy, you yeah. know, I'm or the contract guy, you know, it's looking big picture. Um, sometimes connecting the dots too. like sometimes I'll have a, a client who's looking for a song for their film and I've got that perfect song, just, you know, make those connections. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, I think I, I take pride in the fact that I hopefully sort of break that, that stigma a bit in terms of what, a, what a lawyer looks like and, how, you know, yeah, no, I think it's important for that. Cause I think a lot of people are scared of that. Or like you said, think it's going to be way too much money. And, and then like you said, in the long run, well, it, it's a little bit now to save you a lot later. Um, yeah. Now, another question I thought of while you were talking about this and, you know, being that you're in a band, um, how important is it for a band who are, together and playing and, and thinking that they want to further the career and maybe get into management and making an album um, and recording. How is how important is that there's an agreement amongst the band members um, 
you know, is that a pl- something that if they're thinking about getting serious, that a conversation with someone like you is important? Yeah. And so what I always say to bands, and again, I've been in one for 16 years plus, you know, bands before that, yeah. um, the most important agreement you can sign is a band agreement. And the reason is that I see this happen all the time where, you know, everything's fine in, in the beginning and, and maybe it stays that way and that's great, you know, but if the history of music is any indication, there is often disputes, right? Yeah. As we, as we know from all, Pink Floyd's a great example. I mean, at one point there was two different bands touring as Pink Floyd, which of course, like you can't have that. It confuses the hell out of the public. And, yeah. and then Roger Waters and David Gilmer ended up suing each other for millions to have that right to say, I am Pink Floyd. Um, so, and, and maybe there never is conflict between band members, and that's great, but the band agreement will not only help avoid conflict, but it'll help provide clarity in terms of how revenues are split when things when success comes. And what I always say to my clients is, if we're not planning for success, then what the hell are we doing this for? You know, like planning, if you think, well, we're not going to succeed, let's not draft a contract. Well, then what? What you're in the wrong industry if you don't think you're going to succeed. Um, so yeah, band agreement deals with major things like who owns the band name. It could be all four of the band members do, or it could be the one person. It's kind of their baby. could be two people like sort of a Rolling Stones thing where there's sort of two people that are kind of in charge. Um, or it could be like a, like a Neil Young thing where he's the guy, he runs everything. It's one person in charge, or it could be the every, everyone's equal, like the Red Hot Chili Peppers where all four of them have equal voting rights, etc. So who owns a band name? How are revenues split when you start making revenues? How are the songwriting, how's the songwriting split between the different writers? Very important because some, sometimes, you know, like as a drummer, I'm, a lot of drummers don't get songwriting, but I'm also a songwriter. So I, I'm bringing song ideas on the guitar, lyric ideas, et cetera. So we just, we split all of our songs equally, but a lot of times that's not the case for it's usually like the singer and the guitar player get songwriting or, or just the singer or songwriter gets, gets uh, sorry, songwriting. Um, so you got to have that discussion. Uh, how are decisions made? You know, how are you going to, de- like who decides if you're going to sign a record deal or, you know, confirm that big tour that you got offered, that big opening slot, which is going to take you away from your family for three months. Who decides yes or no to that tour? Um, how are new members hired or how are existing members fired? That's a big one. Yeah. Um, so yeah, all these things become part of the band agreement. And so again, it just adds clarity. So if there ever is a, an issue come that comes up, you say, look, here's what we agreed to three years ago. Here's, here's what we're looking at without that band agreement in place. You're just, if, if two people are doing this, then you're at a standstill and that's where things can get, get messy. Yeah, it's really interesting, you know, hearing you talk about it, and I'm, my mind's just kind of twirling as the amount of bands that I know that have no agreement, um, and I have bands that I know where members in the band have come to me and, and talked to me and say, "Hey, I, I don't agree with what they're doing, but I don't really feel like I have a say. It's not really my band, but they're on the album cover and they're they're part of the band." Um, but I think it's just. I think it's super important and and uh, something that you mentioned too just knowing who is in charge of this and and laying it out there and so you kind of know for the future is it you know the person who put it together is it is it their baby and and everyone else is really just side people or um but how how simple can that agreement get like does someone have to go to uh someone like you or can they just lay out terms um ahead of time or how how far should someone take because i think it's a really important topic that this doesn't get uh talked about and i think band members too are probably too afraid to bring it up because they don't want to cause a riff or an argument or you know lose their spot in the band or something like that um you know how do you bring that up and and really how how far should you you take it yeah, good question. So I try to like in every contract I draft, I try to balance the the two sides of my my brain, which is lawyer and, and musician. You know, yeah. keep it, you know, make sure it covers everything legally, but 
draft it in layman's terms. You know, and I think I think that's something I've become good at over the years. Because one thing I can't stand is lawyers that over lawyer things and make it really complex to read. You know, even to there's some contracts that as a lawyer, having done it for a decade, I look at the contract and I you almost need to draw a chart to try to connect the dots. Is what the hell is this? clause referring to this clause and that that clause affects this other clause and you know you, you need like seriously like a, a, an engineering degree to figure out where where all these things connect yeah. and it, ultimately that's meant to confuse confuse clients right uh, or confuse the other side and then justify your crazy high billing and that's not how I operate I try to keep it simple make sure it covers everything and it's just clearly understood because that's what I want to read as, as a, as a lawyer and as a musician. So it doesn't have to be overly complex, um, but I wouldn't, I've seen, I, I wouldn't advise that you draft it yourself because there's a lot of things to think about, yeah. you know, and with songwriting, for, as an example, there's different, different rights within songwriting in terms of who can administer the, the compositions, who can, have approval rights. If the song's being used, you know, somewhere else, like it, it just, it's too complex. I would say for the average person to go draft a band agreement. Um, but that being said, I keep it as simple as I can. Yeah. And what I often do is if I've got a band that's saying, do we need a band agreement? I send them, I've drafted this, this questionnaire that I've made up through over the years. It's like, you know, whatever 15 questions you need to answer about your band. And then that, that tells me, you know, what to put in the band agreement. So it's questions, like I said, who, who, who decides if a new member is hired or who decides if someone's fired, you know, and um, who has control of the master recordings? Is it one person? Is it two? Is it the whole band? Um, so yeah, basically I've drafted a questionnaire that keeps it simple. And it's, I always ask that sort of on the spectrum of bands, I, I would say, are you like the chili peppers where everything's equal? Are you Neil Young where it's like one person's in sort of in charge or are you Rolling Stones where there's sort of like two people in charge and, that's the whole spectrum and every band sort of sits somewhere on that spectrum. Um, and yeah, so I, I think reach out to someone, an entertainment lawyer that you trust and yeah, they can help, they can help you go from there and it doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't have to rock the boat or, or cause, you know, issues between members. I, I find that it's the opposite if you do it right. Yeah. Because it adds clarity. Between, exactly. It's like, just like with any relationship, you know, like the more you communicate openly, the better the relationship's going to be. And, and that's the same with bands. It's, yeah. It's a interesting subject. Cause I, I, there's like probably another 25 questions I could ask you about that, but I'll, I'll <laughs> slim it down to like one or two more. Uh, yeah. Cause I think there's going to be a lot of people interested in, in this. Um, what level of a band should do this? So if you're playing, if you're a country band playing, a country bar on the weekend doing cover songs, maybe the odd original. Um, would they think that this is a something they should do? Because um, you know, some people may think, "Well, we're not really at the point that we should be doing this." At what point do you think someone should look at doing this? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a it's a great question. I think. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting with cover bands or tribute bands, you know, because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, you don't need the whole songwriting portion of the agreement unless there is song. Like, if there's even one original song, put something in writing just so you know who, who can do what with that song, what the splits are, et cetera. But let's say it was just a straight cover band. I mean, there still is a lot of value there in the brand, right? Like if you're a cover band that is playing on the weekends and getting decent guarantees, well, there's a brand there, right? It's whatever, you know, whatever the cover band's name is, you don't want other people to just all like start using that name. Cause that's your, your brand. Um, but who owns that brand? Like who is it? Is it the singer or is it, is it sort of again, two people or is it the whole band? Um, so I guess, I mean, at the end of the day, it really, it's sort of a cost benefit analysis, right? Like, yeah. and I think for most bands, reach out to me, I, I'll send you the questionnaire and that'll help me decide if you need a band agreement. And then we can sort of talk, then I can assess how complex does it need to be, the agreement, and then I can send a quote. And then it's like, that'll let you know, okay, 
the quote is, you know, we'd make, that's like uh, a half, half of our guarantee for one night. Well, maybe it's worth it. Or, or maybe it's guaranteed for one night of shows. That's what the cost would be. Well, if we play 50 shows a year, then that makes sense. It's worth it. Right. Yeah. Um, it won't be the cost of 50 shows guarantees. I, I can, I can promise that, you know? <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Uh, and one kind of spinoff little question from this. What if you're backing an artist, say you're, you're a hired guns, maybe there's a band leader, you're the band for X front person. Um, yeah. Have you negotiated anything for people in those positions? How often does that get done? Yeah. And so a lot of times I will be hired by the, the front person to be like, you know, I'm, I'm, there's two different scenarios there you brought up. Like one is the session player that is recording in the studio, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a hotshot guitar player that can play everything. They get hired to go in on a country record in the studio and lay down some, some great country guitar picking. Um, I think in that situation, the either side, the guitar player or the, you know, the, the front person could really benefit from having something in writing. The guitar player could benefit because they want to know, A, what am I going to get paid? You know, let's put that in writing. So I get paid this as soon as I'm done. Um, if that guitar player is also contributing to songwriting on that song, then you definitely got to clarify that. I just call this a session player agreement. And then the singer or the, the person who's hiring the, uh, the, the guitar player would really want this because you want to clarify, again, that this person's getting paid this, but not, not anything more. Um, the person doesn't, the guitar player doesn't own any part of the master recording because you want to be able to take the master and go do what you want with it without, you know, that, that person being able to stop you. Um, and then you also want to clear the songwriting point. So usually the session player is not a songwriter, typically. Um, but there's exceptions, right? If, if they write something that's so amazing that defines the song, then then maybe they deserve some songwriting, you know? Um, so yeah, you want to clarify this person is in this in the example that where they're not a songwriter. You want to clarify, you know, so and so play guitar in the song. We're, I'm paying him this much, and he's not doesn't own the master and doesn't own part of the songwriting. Boom, you know. Now the second example you sort of brought up is for live shows. If you're the hired gun and you want to go on tour, then I think yeah, both sides want to clarify that because you know yeah, what's the main thing there is what are you getting paid per day, plus or per show plus per diems, um, and that's kind of the, the main thing is like you know we're going to cover your travel, you're going to be in the bus or whatever, and we're, we're, we're going to cover your hotels and get you know you're, obviously you're not paying for gas but we're going to pay this much per show and this much per diem. Yeah. It's good to have that. It's basically like an employment agreement really, but it's yeah. sort of a contractor agreement in the music world. Yeah. Yeah. I think more people do that without a contract than, than do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Well, and I've had, so I've had issues where like, yeah, let's say I'm representing that guitar player. They come back from tour and the tour made less than the, the headliner thought. And then all of a sudden that headliner is trying to lowball you and pay you less than he had verbally agreed at the beginning. And it's like, Hey man, I lost my shirt on this tour. So I'm going to give you 70% of what I said I was going to give you. And of course the guitar player's got wife and kids to feed and it just gets messy. Right. And yeah. uh, if it was a simple one or two page agreement, well then there'd be no discussion. It's, it's, it's in, it's in, it's in writing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. And there's always the, knowing where to draw that line where it's, you know, if I do this, will I get hired for the next tour again? You know, yeah. that's, that's the difficult decision to make. It's like, how far do I take it? And, and will this cause me my work? But then, you know, I, I just, it's just being honest. I think maybe you don't want to work to, for someone who does that, you know, that yeah. makes perfect sense. Yeah. There's the, there's those intangible elements for sure. You it's yeah, it can get, get muddy for sure yeah uh well we'll start wrapping up um brian did you have anything you wanted to uh add in there the whole interview here has been fascinating i've learned mm -hmm. so much and a lot of things even after 40 years in this business you you think you know it all and you think you know everything and we we all don't know everything and it's kind of nice to 
here I'm with you 100% when you're talking about bringing you to the table or an entertainment lawyer to the table the first day instead of the halfway through the project. It makes it a lot smoother and a lot better. So I agree. Anybody that's getting into this needs to do that. Well, thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Yeah. So let's wrap up with a couple questions. Um, you probably get asked this uh, a lot. If you had to choose one or the other, uh, what would it be, drummer or lawyer? Oh. <laughs> That's, I mean, they both are so fundamental in who I am. Oh, I know. Uh, <laughs> but one had to go away for some reason. Uh, you had to choose. What would, what would it be? You know, um, it's like I feel – like I wouldn't be an entertainment lawyer if not for being a musician first and foremost, yeah. you know? Um, so I, if I, if I went back in time and never was a musician, I would never have become an entertainment lawyer, yeah. you know? So that like being a musician, really being a music lover, you know, I was a music lover for, I was a fan of music first as I'm sure you guys were right. Like yeah, before you got into your career, like, and I, and I meet some musicians that, that aren't, they weren't fans. Like they almost like were always just a musician, um, which to me is no fun because it, it takes, and, or, or they forget how to be a fan when they become a musician, if that makes sense. Like you sort of, you can't go to the concert without just picking apart little things because you're, and that's never me. I, I, I'm a fan first and foremost of music. You know, I'll go to a show and I'm not thinking about the law. I'm not thinking about the, 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 the drum techniques. I'm just feeling it with a beer in my hand in the front row, you know, and yeah. um, what a great gift that is to be able to just, you know, it, it really is like allows you to feel that innocence you had when you were a kid. Right. And um, that's the, the gift of music, right. It's just, t it takes you to places that very few things um, can, you know? So I guess in that way, I think I'd have to like, I wouldn't have any of the things I have if not for being a fan and a lover of music. So I guess if I had to pick one, I'd, I'd pick drummer, but, then again, the entertainment lawyer side pays the bills, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, I hear you. <laughs> um, so the one question I always like to ask everyone, we'll wrap up in this one and it's, it goes to your musician side. Do you have a venue uh, or a place out there in the world that you've never performed at, but it's on the top of your bucket list that you'd like to do? Well, I mean, we always said as a band and this, this, um, it still holds true. I mean, the goal was always to play Madison square garden, which, you know, um, it's just sort of, you know, all my idols, whether it be, you know, Pearl jam or Led Zeppelin or whatever. I mean, once you get to Madison square garden, like that's sort of the crown jewel. Um, and we, we did, we toured arenas. We've done it. Well, twice now we did it once with Def Leppard and that was amazing. We toured all the big arenas in Canada and, awesome. you know, that was the first time we ever done that. And, still probably the main highlight of, of of our career for me is yeah getting on the big stage hitting the kick drum and it just sounds like a bomb going off in the in the place you know and yeah uh it's still I mean, it made my arm hair stand up you know f for the whole first song you know and um because that was always we were unabashedly trying to become you know be, become a stadium band you know and um so yeah i think and then we did it again with Judas Priest, which is kind of cool just to see the metal, the metal crowd, which we're not exactly metal. We're just rock and roll, but just to see that, you know, the, the devotion there. And then again, Rolling Stones, that was 70,000 people or something like that. And um, those, you know, those sort of moments are just that sort of size of, of crowd is just incredible. So yeah, I think Madison Square Garden, or, I mean, lately I keep seeing like some of my clients that played Red Rocks. Or, yeah. Um, you know, and that's like, I, I think that would just be cool. Like I saw the dead South play there last year. And I mean, yeah, that, that'd be pretty, pretty special moment. You know, it's amazing how red rocks comes up all the time. I mean, that's, it's the top of my list and, you know, top two or three for sure. Um, yeah. so yeah, cool. So if people wanted to reach out, uh, and find out more about you on the socials or website, what's the best way to get hold of you? Yeah, it's really easy. Just lawyer drummer. Um, so lawyerdrummer.com is the website. And like I said, the, the articles on there are what have sort of kind of really gotten me that recognition around the world is, you know, I get picked up New York post interviewed me last week about the whole lady antebellum uh, issue. And they, they just, they found my articles on, on my website. And so 
lawyerdrummer.com, go to the article section and I just post, yeah, do you need a band agreement? Should you give your producer songwriting? Um, all all the, the issues we've talked about today are all, I put it in article form because no one else has done it. So I thought I should do it, you know, and to help out other musicians. And then, yeah, Instagram, Lawyer Drummer, uh, Facebook, Lawyer Drummer, whatever, you know. So go check. Mostly just, I always say to artists, just go go educate yourself, go empower yourselves because there's people in the music biz that will try to take advantage of you if you're not educated on these t topics. And that's kind of been my mission from day one is like to stop, to help my other musicians from signing the bad, the wrong deal, you know. It's hard enough to make a living in this biz as it is. The last thing you need is a horrible contract or someone who's, you know, a snake out there trying to, to make it even harder for you. You know, yeah, totally. And they are out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Still. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Well, thanks again. Uh, this has been lightning. Just hang on. And after we finish up here, we'll say a formal goodbye. But I uh, really appreciate you spending your time. And I uh, really enjoyed this one uh, a lot. So I think a lot of people are going to get a lot from it. And hopefully they'll go check out your website and learn even more and get in touch with you. Uh, it's been a real pleasure. And I know Brian uh, will feel the same. Yeah. It's great. Well, thanks. thank you both. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah.